Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Um, welcome to our final um, final part of their new sponsor training. My name is Bobby Beach. I'm the school nutrition specialist. And the same housekeeping items, we ask you um, to please mute yourself during the presentation. We are recording so we can distribute later for anyone that would like to rewatch um, any of our presentations that we've given. There will be a question and answer se section at the end, and you may utilize the comment section as we go, go along and type any questions you have in there. The agenda for today, we're going to cover resource management, the administrative review, procurement review. I'll talk about some other federal programs and some grant opportunities, as well as USDA's COVID response and some flexibilities that are available to you. And last but not least, our question and answer section. Resource management. Um, resource management refers to the management of your nonprofit school food service account. And for those of you unaware of what that means, a nonprofit school food service account is the restricted account in which all of the revenue from your school food service operations conducted by the school food, their school food authority. And it's principally for the benefit of school children is retained and used only for the operation or improvement of your nonprofit school food service program. So the nonprofit school food service account, um, it could be a separate account or it could be commingled with your general account. If it's commingled, you must have mechanisms in place to accurately track all revenue and expenses expenses to that account and you must monitor those for allowability and any revenue ex in excess of your expenditures must not be used to some more support any other expenditures that are commingled in that account with so we always recommend that you keep a separate account for all those revenues from your school lunch program So your nonprofit school food service revenue, and this includes any reimbursement, those federal dollars you will be reimbursed for, for the meals that you serve, and must solely be used for your operation or improvement of your school food service program. You can use these revenues for food, equipment, labor, and other, other standard expenses needed to operate your meal program. You also can use these revenues or you cannot, sorry, use these revenues to purchase land, buildings or construct any buildings. Um, there's some requirements um, for net cash resources and this refers to your revenues in excess of your expenditures. So your positive balance in that account. Um, it's limited to having a three months average operating expenditures. Um, so looking over at your end of the year this year, looking at your average expenditures for the three months, um, your balance cannot exceed that number. So say you're looking at the total year, you're going to take your total expenditures, divide it by the number of months that you were in session, so whether that be 10, 11, or if you were operating all 12 months, you're going to take that average monthly expenditure calculation, multiply it by three, and that is the amount you cannot exceed in that account. And those requirements are set forth to ensure that those funds are being continuously invested into your program to improve your program operations and your meal quality. Um, when I referenced before, you're monitoring for allowable costs. And this is in the Code of Federal Regulations. It's the same regulations that monitor or uh, monitor all grants for allowable costs. Um, in general, any costs that you're charging to that account must be necessary, 
reasonable, and allocable for the program. Any equipment purchase that you make throughout the year, if it's over that $5,000 threshold, they must be pre-approved. And this can be pre-approved from our state pre-approved list. So if you're purchasing equipment on that list, you won't need to seek any additional approval. Or you would submit an equipment approval request. And I've included these documents in the program invitation. And as I mentioned on Friday, I will send all these resources again via email. Paid lunch equity. Um, this requirement is intended to ensure that the school food authorities are providing sufficient fun funds to their nonprofit school food service account for your paid lunches. And these requirements are making sure that you're not bankrupting that account because you're charging too little for your paid lunches. Currently, USDA sends the paid lunch equity at $3.05. Um, if you're exceeding this, and this will come into play next year after you have a full year um, for the number of meals served, um, we'll then look at what you're charging for those lunches. So if you're charging over the $3.05, you're considered to meet equity and meeting those requirements. And if you're under, if you'd like to, um, for example, keep your paid lunches at $2 to be reasonable for your family, your paid um, eligible children to afford those meals, you have a couple options um, that you can do, but still meeting that equity. So you can contribute non-federal funds and we will provide a paid lunch equity tool that would help you assess if you were to keep that paid lunch price at your $2, how much non-federal funds would you have to contribute to your nonprofit school food service accounts to subsidize those meals? Um, and this can be from, the non-federal funds can be from your general fund, it can be from a, um, a parent donation, um, any of these sources would work. You also have the, pro, uh, the option to raise your price and contribute non-federal funds. So you've determined, you know, you want to increase from that $2, for example, maybe to $2.50. You can still consider that reasonable for your parents and your families to pay. Um, but then to meet equity, you're going to contribute non-federal funds. So you could do a combination of both. And if you have a positive balance in your nonprofit school food service account, as of December 31st, you are exempt from raising your um, pay lunch prices to meet equity. Uh, next, I want to talk about revenue from non-program foods, and this refers to any foods and beverages that are sold in your participating schools apart from any reimbursable meals or meal supplements supplements um, that are being purchased from your nonprofit school food service account. So this can include a la carte items, adult meals, um, food placed in vending machines, fundraisers, school stores, catered or vended meals. And again, this only applies if you're using funds from your nonprofit school food service account to purchase the materials to provide your a la carte or your adult meals, et cetera. Um, if you're using those funds to provide um, these extra services, um, all revenue must accrue back to your nonprofit school food service account. So you must, you must charge greater than or equal to the cost of that item. And if you're using adult meals, for example, um, you would use your highest paid lunch price for your students, making sure that that covers your meal cost, and you would include a 25 cents extra to encompass any, or to cover any USDA foods that were used to produce that item. Now, indirect cost. Indirect costs are often a percent that's applied to your school account. Um, indirect costs will have an indirect cost rate agreement and this is negotiated and proved by your state educational agency, though so this would most likely be provided by the Department of Education. 
Um, these indirect cost rates do expire annually. So if that's being applied to your nonprofit school food service account, you must ensure that the accurate percent is being applied for the fiscal year. And indirect costs um, typically um, provide or covering a number of different services, including some administrative overhead functions, fringe benefits, accounting, payroll, purchasing, facilities management, and utilities. Um, so it's also crucial that you get a list of all the services that are being provided that are encompassed in that indirect cost um, percentage that's being applied to your account. And this is to ensure that there's no double dipping to that account um, as you're having costs charged. Um, so for example, if utilities is encompassed in that indirect cost rate, um, we shouldn't or you shouldn't when you're monitoring that account, see um, a line item for utilities because it was already encompassed in that indirect cost percent that was applied to that account. And so you're going to keep any documentation of any um, indirect costs that was applied um, and the typical um, any services that that should have included. Um, so next I wanted to touch on the administrative review and give you a brief um, overview of that process. So the administrative review is basically our compliance review for the program and it's to assess the school food authorities administration of your national school lunch, your school breakfast program, any on any other federal programs you may elect into. And this review is going to cover all the areas that we've gone through in our new sponsor training. So it will cover performance standard one, which were your um, your certification and your benefit issuance. We'll look at performance standard two, which is your meal pattern, reimbursable meals, your meal counting and claiming. The comprehensive resource management um, will, depending on how that account is managed and the different purchases you made over the year, um, will look into the management of your nonprofit school food service account. And then we will also look at the general area. So everything I covered on Friday will look to meet that you're meeting the program requirements. These reviews operate in a three year cycle. So currently we're in year two of our current cycle and all of our school food authorities must be reviewed within the three year cycle. So from the 51 sponsors that we have, we're gonna review all 51 in three years. So any of our new SFA, so that's including all of um, all of you on the training today will be reviewed in their first year. And this is mainly um, to provide training and technical assistance. We do understand that there's um, a number of different requirements for the program. So we like to visit you all in the first year to make sure that you're following the various requirements. If we have any questions, we can address them at that time. We want to make sure you're on a good foot. Um, instead of waiting three years down the line and reviewing it and having to take fiscal action because there are certain requirements that haven't been met. Um, so you all will be receiving that review this year. You will be notified six weeks prior. And the only thing different this year is you may be receiving this review completely off site. So we may be doing some distance um, viewing of your meal services um, via Zoom or Teams. And we will let you all know as that um, comes closer in, your, in that notification of your review. Some potential impacts, um, there's corrective action. So during the review, if we've identified any deficiencies, um, any other requirements that you may not be meeting, we will require corrective action. Um, so after our review, we will issue a report within 30 days um, that lists any deficiencies noted. And the corrective action um, will be either requesting more documentation um, so we can document that, you know, the various requirements are being done correctly. Or we'll ask you to um, design a business process or standard operating procedures to put in place um, the necessary steps so we make sure that this doesn't happen again. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, we'll um, we will provide technical assistance while we're on site or, you know, conducting these reviews remotely. Um, if there's anything that can be fixed, we want to give you the opportunity to fix while we're there on site. Um, fiscal action is also a possibility in this. Um, is mainly applied to any findings in performance standard one or performance standard two. Um, if there's any fiscal action or the potential of, we let you know during the review in the exit conference. You also get official letter of fiscal action, and this will be deducted from your future claims. And then lastly, public notification. This is a fairly new requirement from USDA, but all um, the results of our administrative reviews that we conduct must um, be provided or posted publicly, which we do post on our website. Um, and in my follow up emails today, I will include a link. So if you're curious of other reviews we've done um, throughout the last couple administrative review cycles, you do have access to that information and you could see some common findings or some typical corrective actions um, that we assign with your administrative review. The next thing I want to talk about is procurement review, and this again is fairly new um, for USDA requirements, and we do um, conduct the procurement reviews in tandem with the administrative review um, to reduce burden on you and your staff because many of the documents we'll request are very similar. And the whole purpose of the procurement review process and why USDA set this forth um, is to monitor um, how you're complying with government-wide procurement standards, so how you're purchasing those products or those services. Procurement standards uh, must be conducted in a manner to provide um, that's providing full and open competition. So because you're using those federal dollars to procure your products and services, you must be getting the um, the best price and giving opportunity to, to everyone in the area or wh whoever can provide these services um, or goods for you, you must have um, open competition so that they can provide them. Um, there are several different procurement methods. Um, the first that I wanted to talk about is micro purchases, and this applies to any purchase under $10,000. Um, so again, any supplies or services, if it is under 10,000, you can make a sole source purchase, meaning that you're purchasing um, from one specific provider or vendor, and this is $10,000 per transaction. Um, if you're going to be purchasing anything over $10,000, but under $250,000, um, then you're required to do three bids and a buy meaning that you're going to shop around um, for three sources that will provide a similar item and go with the best price out of those three quotes that you obtain. And as I'm talking through these, these are all federal um, thresholds. So if in your SFA, if you wanted to be more restrictive, um, that is your option to do so. And then the last procurement method applies to any purchases over 250,000 or more. Um, if this is the case, you can do a sealed bid or competitive proposal. And the difference with a sealed bid, um, this would you would be releasing an invitation a bit, an invitation for bid, and the award is based solely on price. Um, so as long as the company is meeting the stipulations that you place in your invitation for bid, you can only grade any proposals you receive um, on price and you must award the lowest price. In a competitive proposal, when you released a request for proposal, um, this is where you can involve a number of different criteria. Um, so it's specific to your school food authority and the price is weighted on the entire proposal. So you're um, waiting on the criteria you specified. You can include delivery options, your meal service options or whatever you're trying to solicit. You're going to include all the factors um, that you wish to receive at your school food authority. And as you're grading it, you must weight the price 
must be the heavily weighted. Um, so you still have the option to award a proposal that um, may work better for your school food authority, even though that it's cost more because they scored higher in the certain areas. And if you are going to be releasing a request for proposal or have any questions, you can always contact me. For any food service management company or vended, mu vended meals, um, you're usually going to go with this formal method, procurement method. So there are a couple of mandatory requirements as we review your purchasing and um, your procurement. Um, the first is the procurement plan. So each SFA must have a formal written document that outlines your purchasing procedures. Um, so you're going to identify your micro, small, and formal procurement method thresholds, which would either be equal to the federal thresholds or stricter. Um, it cannot exceed those. Um, in your plan, you must prohibit the acquisition of unnecessary or duplicate items. Um, it also must include that you ensure that all solicitations incorporate a clear and accurate description of the material product or service to be procured. And then it also must not be duly restrictive to limit your competition and take steps to assure that small minority and women's businesses are being used whenever possible. And so we do have a template for a procurement plan that is attached to the meeting invitation. And again, I will send those after as well. Um, also required is a code of conduct. Um, and this is basically um, your procedures and policies that govern any in individuals that are involved with your procurement practices. And this is to limit any conflict of interest, um, that all these purchases are being made ethically, um, and there must state that there will be disciplinary actions or for any violations of this code of conduct. Um, so next I want to talk about some other federal programs that are available to you if you wish to participate. The first is the after school snack program. So the after school snack program is considered under the national school lunch program and it must be served after school hours. So after the school day has ended. Um, there's required to be an educational enrichment activity and this could be a, um, a various um, different programs or activities. Um, so it could be tutoring, you can have some clubs after school. If you're doing distance education, as long as you're providing some enrichment activities, this could be, you know, additional workbooks, some, um, any activity that can be done at home. Um, it just must not be a paid activity. So the students can enroll in this without having to pay to participate. And in the after school snack program, you would either offer a regular snack or area eligible. So if your free and reduced lunch rate is over 50%, um, you're able to provide all snacks for free to all students. Um, if it is under the 50%, you would be operating a regular snack program. Would you, you would still be counting by eligibility and claiming any students you served under the paid free and reduced categories. For the after school snack program, um, there is two self monitoring um, visits required a year, similar to the on site assessments I mentioned in, on Friday. So the first self monitoring must take place within four weeks of your meal service. So when your after school snack program service begins, you must conduct the first one within that first four weeks. And the second time must be conducted before that meal service program ends for the year. And in the meal pattern, as I also mentioned on Friday, um, you would serve two of the five components. So either a milk, a grain, fruit, vegetable, or meat, meat alternate. It just cannot be two drinks, for example, a milk and 100% juice. And it must be two different components. So you couldn't serve an apple in 100% apple juice or 100% orange juice and still be reimbursable. It has to be different components. Now the fresh fruit and vegetable program. Now this is a grant program that will be available 
um, to you for the next school year. And this program aims to increase children's exposures to the consumption or exposure and consumption of a variety of fruits and vegetables. So any elementary school that's participating in the National School Lunch Program has and has a 50% free and reduced lunch percentage is eligible to participate. And we release the request for applications in April and May. And you will receive a notification if any of your schools qualify and details of how to apply. But if awarded, you must provide either fruit or vegetable, and this could be a whole piece of fruit or vegetable or a taste twice a week to your students. And in the award, um, based on your enrollment, you'll receive $50 to $75 per student to offer um, the fresh fruit and vegetable program twice a week for the entire school year. USDA Foods Entitlement is a program that you'll have the option to participate in next year. Um, and what this is, is sponsors can receive entitlement dollars based on the number of meals that they serve. So in this year, um, and they can be used to purchase U, um, USDA foods. And how this is calculated um, is you'll take the prior year's number of lunches. So next year, if you decide to operate, we'll look at the total number of lunches you serve this year. And then you multiply it by the per meal rate that USDA sets. And for this year, it's 37 cents. And this will equal the total dollar value for entitlement. And I like to refer to entitlement as NDA bucks. So you won't get a check for the, um, your dollar amount for entitlement, but you could use um, this entitlement or NDA bucks to purchase food for your program. Um, so there's three different ways that you can use it. You can purchase USDA direct delivery foods, and this includes a number of canned and frozen fruits and vegetables, uh, frozen ground beef or unseasoned chicken strips, um, you can also purchase processing products, and this includes, and depending on the contracts we have at the time, um, pizza, chicken nuggets, Mexican food items, eggs, um, a variety of different, um, um, different processed products. Or you can process fresh produce through the Department of Defense Fresh Fruit or Fresh Produce Program. And there are some costs associated. So if you would decide to use the USDA direct delivery food, and again, this is your canned and fro frozen items, the entitlement would cover the actual cost of the item itself, and then you would pay the, for the shipping and handling per case out of pocket. Um, for processed food, um, the entitlement, again, would cover the cost of the USDA food being provided to that processor to turn it into your um, finished product. So you would just pay out of pocket the shipping and handling per case and a processing fee. And then if you decide to do fresh produce to the Department of Defense program, um, the entitlement will cover the entire cost of, of the food items and there's no out of pocket cost um, for any fresh fruit and vegetables you receive from the Department of Defense program. And so this could be a, a huge cost savings um, for your school food program. And if you use a meal vendor, this is still an option that you can opt into and you would divert your entitlement to your meal vendor. So either um, depending on what you decide and, and once you talk to your meal vendor, um, you could have them order the products that they need to produce your meals or yourself. And then you would have those items um, either shipped directly to your vendor or you would receive those on site for your vendor to pick up. And then they can incorporate it into the meals that they're providing for you. Um, if this is being done, you must monitor um, that your entitlement is being used. So they're using whatever foods are provided and that your vendor is crediting you for the food that you're providing through entitlement. So for example, if you order um, fresh produce through the DOD program and you spent $300 on entitlement per month, your meal vendor 
um, must be giving you a credit for that $300, that value of entitlement that they used in your program um, directly off your invoice. Um, so they would be crediting you that amount because you're um, providing these products for them. And if you have any questions about entitlement, you can always contact our entitlement specialist. So this would be Bernadette DeMars or Shauna Sabo um, at their emails provided. And again, this will be an option for next year as you're renewing um, to do the program um, for the 21-22 school year. We also have some grant opportunities for you all. Um, this year we will have an equipment assistance grant and so this allows state agencies to competitively award equipment assistant grants to eligible school food authorities. So if you're participating in the National School Lunch Program, which you all are, um, you have the option to apply for equipment. You can request up to $5,000 of equipment per site and you can request up to 20,000 for your school food authority. Um, you must, any equipment that you're requesting has to be at least $1,000 per equipment that you are requesting. And then if you have a high free and reduced lunch percentages, you, percentage at your school site, you will be given priority. And you will look for that request for application to be released in December and we will issue an email and directions on how to apply for that grant. And then lastly, I wanted to cover our USDA COVID response. So there's a number of different flexibilities that were issued from USDA. Um, to help you um, better provide meal services during um, the COVID times we live in. Um, so the first one is the nationwide non-congregate waiver. This waiver allows um, school food authorities to serve in alternate locations in the cafeteria. So if you're needing to um, do a distribution model where you're providing kind of a drive through service for distance learners, um, this waiver would apply. And again, if you elect into this program, uh, or into this waiver, it is valid for the entire school year. There's a nationwide mealtime waiver that allows you to serve outside of the mealtime requirements um, issued by USDA. So typically lunch has to be served between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, this can waive those requirements. So if you, again, are offering multiple days meals or providing breakfast and lunch in the same distribution, um, this waiver would allow you to do that. There is um, another waiver to waive the offer versus serve requirement for your 9th through 12th grades. So if it's not feasible for you to do an offer versus serve meal service and really give those students a choice um, due to um, the meal service location or just the difficulty in providing that option, um, you can elect into that and again valid for the entire school year. Um, there's a parent pickup waiver that allows um, parents and guardians to be able to pick up student meals on behalf of their students. Um, and again, valid through the entire school year. Um, the next is the meal pattern waiver. So if you're finding that your vendors or if you're self operated, um, you're finding difficulties in meeting the meal pattern due to supply shortages, exorbitant costs from your vendors, or um, based on the type of distribution model or meal service model that you have planned, um, you can opt into this waiver. And if you do elect the meal pattern waiver, you must be specific into what requirements of the meal pattern that you would be waiving, and you must provide a clear and valid justification um, there is the option to elect into this meal pattern for the entire school year. And as you may have received our opt-in waiver, we're, um, we're approving these waivers on a shortened time frame. Um, so they would be a valid um, through December 31st. And then if you still need these flexibilities, you would have the option to opt in again. 
And then lastly, um, we have a Nevada specific waiver, and this is in regards to the school wellness policy. Um, so because Nevada is strict in, or more restrictive in some areas in their school wellness policy, if you're having um, issues with meeting that meal consumption requirement, um, providing that 15 minutes for breakfast and 20 minutes for lunch, or the 30 minute opportunity for physical activity, you can request to waive both of those requirements. And that's about it for our training today. So I'm gonna open it up to if anyone has any questions. And it doesn't look like there has been any questions in the chat um, and I'm not hearing any from anyone right now. But so I want to thank you all for attending today um, and attending all three of our trainings. Um, again, I will send some follow up emails to provide the number of different resources I talked about during these trainings and answer some follow up questions if there was any questions not answered in the chat. Um, if you do have any additional questions, you can always contact anyone from our team or myself, and I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of your Monday.